pride of English football. This is what being a football fan is all about. Together, anything is possible. Evening Cherries fans and welcome to the Cherries Trust YouTube channel. My name is Craig and today we've got a very, very special interview for you. Um, we will also be bringing you exclusive content on this channel along with the Trust activities as well as regular shows. Tonight we've got an interview with a player who has played 121 games for the club, scoring 56 times before moving to Watford and had previously played he played for the Hornets beforehand as well. But before I bring him in, I introduce to you somebody who you will recognise from the Trust, Peter Ive. Hello. Evening, evening, Peter. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Looking forward to this. Yep, same here, same here. And to welcome in my special guest, I have got the one and only Lufa Blizzard. <laughs> evening, Lufa. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm very good. I'm very good indeed, thank you. How are you guys doing? Yeah, very well. Thank you, Lufa. So, um, firstly, let's start off where it all began. So, thought, you was born in Jamaica. I thought you were going to start where it ended yesterday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it was a very good result for us. Not for Watford, but <laughs> for us. <laughs> but you was born in Jamaica in 1958 and joined Watford as an apprentice in 1974. No, Tell no. us a little bit... No, on that one, I joined, um, I actually joined as an apprentice in 76. 76? 76, yeah. yeah. But do tell us a little bit more about your early life leading up to joining the Hornets. Well, I grew up in, uh, in Wills and having came from Jamaica at the age of, I think it was six, I was, when I arrived in England. And uh, I remember there was no more sunshine, it was... I think we arrived, it was snowing, I think, very soon afterwards. So that was one of those things that I'd never experienced before. So, um, yeah, so there was the snow and it was cold and it was wet. And not like being in the Caribbean when you're in Jamaica and the sun shines every day and you've got to be 300 yards away from the house and that sort of thing. So that was very different. Um, so coming to England was, was, as I say, it was different. So I came over with my elder sister, eldest brother, and uh, we re were reunited with our uh, mum and dad, who came over a, a year previously to get accommodation and settle down and, uh, and then obviously await our arrival. Fantastic. And when you was playing, uh, when you grew up, was growing up and making that transition into the football play that you became, um, what was the steps to that on that journey? Well, it, was, it all started playing football at school. I remember at the age of about seven or eight, uh, they were picking the team for at school, and you know the, the, the head, te no, head teacher, the sports teacher said, "Right, what positions does everybody want to play?" And they went through all the positions, and the only position left was left back, and nobody wanted to play left back. So I said, "I'll play left back." Um, I've never played football before until I came to England, and so I played left back. And uh, from left back, I moved as I got older, about nine, ten, to centre half, and I played at centre half from about nine, ten until I was. 13 or 14, must have been 14, I think I was. And that was when I first went and played up front. And I didn't even play out the middle that day. I actually went and played on the left wing. And, um, you know, as they say from there on, you know, the rest is history. I uh, made a bit of name for myself in the youth teams and that and signed for Watford. And uh, here we are. Excellent. Well, in your first spell at Watford, you played 246 games, scoring just shy of 100 goals. You helped the club rise from the old fourth division to the first division. And you were the division's top scorer, so the first division's top scorer, with 27 goals in the first season there. Do tell us a little bit more about the rise through the leagues, the lows, but I expect there's many more highs. Yeah, thankfully there were. I think the lows really only started once we got to the second division when we just probably didn't quite get things right. But back in the fourth division when Graham Taylor arrived, he he set us on the right track because he was about bringing in some of the young players. So players like myself, which were always on the periphery of what was going on prior, suddenly had an opportunity to be involved full-time with the first team and try and make a name for yourself and get into the first team squad 
um, at that time, which there was only 12 people that really travelled to a game. There was 11 that started and one for the bench. So, uh, you know, it was real. It was really tough call to be one of those 11 and then obviously to be the one on the bench. And that's how myself and so many players at that time started. Graham came in and he gave the team new purpose and really galvanised what was there. And it was about everybody fighting for the same cause and playing for Watford Football Club, playing for the shirt, playing for the supporters. And you see, that was that was also one of the things what I liked about when I went to Bournemouth. It was very, very similar. So um, f- for me at that time, the opportunity was there to establish myself with somebody who was willing to give me that opportunity. Um, because prior to that, I was, um, you know, when Graham arrived in 77, at the end of that season, he arrived, uh, he arrived um, I believe they were thinking of releasing me. And Tom Wally, who was the coach who played there, his brother was at uh, Crystal Palace as a coach. And he had said, look, if Watford let, let him go, take him straight away because this boy might be uh, might be something special. And uh, thankfully, when Graham arrived and he listened to Tom, said, don't, you know, you keep him because this boy's got something. Um, yeah. And so that's really how close it was to me really starting out somewhere else. And maybe who knows what would have happened. You know, so coming to the leagues, when we got into coming to the leagues, the first one in the fourth division, I spent most of that season coming off the bench um, in that one. And, uh, you know, we won that, we won the fourth division that year. And um, it was, it was, it was amazing, really, because we, we just sort of rolled teams over again and again and again. And it was, uh, it was very, very special. So you start to think this is what it was like all the time. We got promotion to the third division. The third division, you know, we battled through that as well. We had an amazing cup tie against Manchester United where we beat them in 78 um, in the third round of the, the League Cup which is an amazing time for myself and for the club. So for us, we just kept the momentum going and we got promotion again from the third to the second. And that was uncharted te- territory for most of the players and for Watford because we were predominantly a fourth, third division club. So playing in that league was a little bit different. We found it more difficult because the teams were less forgiving if you made mistakes and you got punished for them. And it was that more difficult to break them down and get goals and we were just really trying to find the right recipe let's say of how to to make the league work and uh, we finally did after being in there for two seasons and we ended up in the first division somewhere new territory for everyone and the belief when we got there was we could beat anyone because we've been doing it in the league in league in uh, in the cup tie for the last two three years so we had no real fear about what we was going into the team had grown together and we were confident and the belief was whoever we put before us, as long as we produced and performed in a manner that we believed we could, we'd have a chance of winning. And so it proved. We had an amazing season. We finished second to Liverpool. Um, I scored 33 goals that season, 27 in the league, um, which Ian Rush was not happy about because I picked him for the goal in group on the last day, actually, because we beat Liverpool at Vicarage Road 2-1. And that goal of mine, um, I think, will be him. I think he finished at 25 and I finished at 27. So, uh, yeah, one for me. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, um, over to you, Peter, for the next question. Right, you played with a few big names. Who would you say was the best that came across, either playing alongside or against? If we stick to English football first, I think I've got to look... You look at um, the likes of Liverpool, as I mentioned a moment ago. When you play against Dalglish and you play against the likes of Rush and Sunes and people like that, you know, that, that team, that Liverpool team at that time was, was a phenomenal team, really was. In every position, they were just, they were what Man City were, Man United were over there through the 90s and whatever, they just dominated. And they were very, very special. So, those players were always difficult to play against. They never gave you anything and they were as hard as nails. You know, they would they would dish it out if they needed to and they would um, they would just make life very difficult for you. So we, we had to adapt and find ways to get results and Liverpool was one of those ones we didn't get many results against them. Um, United, we got the odd result here and there. Um, the Chelsea's we were okay against. The Arsenal's were okay against. But it was mainly as like Everton and the sort of Manchester United more than Man City. 
and and obviously Liverpool. They were the biggest ones at that time, which were a big, were difficult games, more difficult games for us. And Leicester City, funny enough, as we came to, they were always a tough one for us. So um, yeah, it was it was quite amazing to finish second and to win the Golden Boot as well. It was uh, it was just one of those things dreams are made of. And of course, you had that million pound move to AC Milan and yeah. spent a year there. Perhaps didn't go as well as you'd have hoped, no. but you did play a fair few games for the club. Yeah, I did. did you enjoy the Italian experience? I think the experience as a whole, I enjoyed it because it was um, every day when you go into training or onto the football pitch, you learn something. No matter how small, whatever, you always learn something. And going to Italy taught me a lot about myself, taught me about how I looked after, how I thought about the game, how I prepared for the game. Um, because it was very different. I was going to a country where defence and not giving goals away was, you know, was really there on the, on the list. And um, so games were very, very tight. Games, games were very difficult. And they didn't ever really want to give the ball away easily. They just kept the ball. Um, and for myself, I found it quite boring because my game was always about getting out of the opposition and getting shots and getting crosses in and creating opportunities. So it never really happened a lot in Italy. Um and yeah, I played, I think I played every game, actually. I played all the cup ties and played all of the league games. So if, uh, if, if things were that awful as uh, some members of the press and some individuals are like to say, you wouldn't have played all the games if that was the case. So uh, it was just the team was not as good a team as it as a Milan team in the, in the, in the past had been. They'd been relegated because of uh, a bribery and all that sort of scandal and whatever. And all the players that, as part of that team, had left your Rossies and all of these people had all left. So they were rebuilding again. And so I was really right at the very beginning in that rebuild um, before they got to the stage where it was about two, three years later when they started to show and started to dominate in Syria and then obviously started to win European Cups as well. Fantastic. So... You returned to Watford after one season in Italy yeah. and spent another four years there. How much had things changed, if at all, when you returned? I think when I came back, I came back to the team itself had changed significantly because a lot of the players like your Ross Jenkins and your Les Taylors and people like that, they were sort of coming to the end, as, I suppose, in a way, like I was, as you start to get to the, the, you know, the, the end of your, your 20s. So... The team was bringing in younger players and these younger players were trying to make their way. The, the way we were playing was evolving, um, you know, but we we're still getting results. But we were not um, the force that we were through that first, especially that first season in, in, the, uh, in the first division. The season I was away, they got to the cup final and that was quite an amazing thing. But, um, you know, to continue on that road and uh, evolve, the team would not progressed in that manner was getting to the level where you thought they'd be up there again in that top two, three or four. And we never really achieved that again. But um, there were some memorable performances along there. Um, you know, I still, I think pretty much per season, apart from ones I've got injured in, I would always get 12, 15 goals a season, at least in those uh, in those lean times as well. Because goals was, was, I play football because I love scoring goals. I love it. I love creating opportunities for other people as well. So it was it was a it was a very good time again. And then you joined the Cherries uh, when Harry Redknapp signed you in November 1988. Um, the transfer fee was sixty thousand, if that's correct. Mm. Um, I, I, I never worry about. I never bother about stuff like that. You always let your <laughs> You have got an accountant and, uh, and solicitors to deal with that sort of thing. They're the ones to deal with that. I just, I just concentrate on the play. Well, it's a bargain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what prompted you to move to the South Coast? Well, the the team, you know, that team, the team had got relegated, and we were starting the season there. And it was Steve Harrison had just taken over towards the the end of that last season, and his thing was to start to build. So he wanted to bring some of the younger people we had. Ewan Roberts, um, we had Malcolm Allen, which were young Welsh international players, and that he was looking to get they, give them more starts to make, you know, so their careers going. So he said to me, um, yes, you can stay. And, you know, if you, you know, if there are games there, you can play great, but I'm looking to go with the, with the younger players. 
And I took that as, yeah, I'll show you, which is what I've done every time. Because throughout my time at the Coudreau, every season, Graham Taylor always brought in at least one other strike, a new striker every year. And uh, my job always was to make sure I saw them off. You know, they were the ones that was going in, they were going to be me. So my attitude is exactly the same. I will, fine, I'll play in the reserves. I had to, but I'll train and work hard and show you that I'm the person that should be playing. Um, and it was a reserve game. I think we played, it was October, we played Millwall at home on a Saturday, which is when you used to play Saturday afternoon as well, just like the first team, the, the reserve team. And we played uh, we played Millwall at home. And I think we beat them three, one or something. I scored a couple in that. And I've been scoring in, in the reserve games anyway. And uh, Harry had, uh, had got a report on that game. And I got the phone call. Would I be willing to come down and uh, and talk to them about coming to Bournemouth? And I went, yeah, some, yeah first team football. Absolutely. So I came down and watched. And it turned out, and I was only chatting to actually um, the, your press guy at Bournemouth a couple of weeks ago. And it was Man City was the game I came down and watched. It was, um, you know, when I came down and watched them that Saturday. And watching the game, I thought to myself, oh, I think I could fit into this team really well. But the players that you got, um, I think I could fit in here. And, you know, I definitely score goals here because of the way the team was playing. And Harry was very keen for me to come and do so. So, yeah, sign. And, um, yeah, it was, you know, as we say, the next three years were just uh, amazing for me down at, down at Bournemouth and my first game, I remember, away at Barnsley was the first game on the Saturday. And it was, um, I remember travelling up, I drove up because I had to leave straight from there to go home afterwards. And I followed this coach all the way there. It took, it took about six hours to get to Barnsley. And I thought to myself, this is murder if this is going to be like every week to travel places. And um, yeah, but we, we got beat. I think we got beat 3-2 or something, 3-1 or something. I scored on my debut because that's something I... I've, I've I've always done, and uh, you know it's going to be brilliant. I'm going to score a few goals here, and we all know what happened to come the uh, come the Tuesday night, didn't we? <laughs> come whole city at home. So yeah, it was a great start for me, and settled in with the players very well, and just settled into the place just as if um, you know I'd been at Watford. And I think I alluded to it earlier on. Bournemouth struck me as what Watford was when I arrived. You know, it was a it was a small family club, and it was about players and about the town and about the people that work there it wasn't about all the stuff that people talk about now it was just about wanting to play football and give the best you could for wearing whatever that shirt was you know if it was a red one or it was a red and black stripe one or whatever it was you know just to put that shirt on and go and give you your best and that's what I'd always attempt to do every time I played for whoever and so to do that when I came to Bournemouth was just second nature to me and um, for me the way Harry wanted to play and allowed us to express ourselves it worked out great for myself what are your what are your me initial memories of harry could you still tell straight away he had the bright future um that he went on to have in management yeah i think you see managers in many ways he reminded me you know there's so many similarities between him and graham taylor they they're very good at picking the players to put together to make the thing work and that was the thing about what I thought Harry was good at. He knew the players and he never gave you too much information. It was he just really just challenged you every week to do the best you could produce your best. The things that you're good at was what you were brought to the club to do. And again, that's what Graham Taylor always said to all of us. So for me, it was a continuation of that. And with the, so the players, you know, your Mark Bishops and the likes, it was it made it, it made it easy for me to set them and and produce uh, and produce goals. You, met, you mentioned Bishop. Um, you played along, along during that, that first season. You played alongside the likes of Ian Bishop, Sean Teal at the back. Um, many of us, many of us. Sean Teal was the second year. Sean Teal was the second year. Sean Teal was the second year. Okay, well, that, that, that they, they're probably amongst Cherry's fans' favourite players. What are your memories of that team over the three years? Oh, the, the, I, I thought when the likes of um, Sean Teal arrived, you know, he gave us that little bit of pace and, you know, he had a bit of steel about him. You know, TV was, you know, he'd, uh, he'd run through brick walls and stuff for you. So that gave us a little bit more stability in that position. And the likes of Bishop, who was just, you know, just such a talent, such a talent he was. And um, it was just, for me, it was a real pleasure, you know, to play with players who 
wanted the ball and wanted to do stuff with the ball. Matty Holmes made his debut as well. And Matty Holmes was one of the best debuts I've ever, ever seen. He looks as if he'd been, you know, at the age of what, I think it was just about 18. And his performance was just incredible for an 18 year old. He looked as if he's a seasoned pro the way he played the game. He ran the midfield, made tackles, made passes, got up and down the pitch. So I, I thought I thought there were some some great players there, some very, very good players. And uh, I think the success we had and um, you know, bore you know, I think really brought that to the fore that the players were good players and yes, you know, certain players moved on and, and went also and, and went elsewhere. But um yeah, the I think the nucleus of what that team that Harry put together was uh, was quite special. And um, just moving on, um, with regards to your time down here, um, you also played alongside the likes of Tony Pulis, Sean O'Driscoll and Kevin yeah. Bonds, who all had um, various amounts of success in management. Did you see them going into management at that time? I think the one per definitely you saw was Tony Pulis. Absolutely, you, you knew he would uh, he would go into that. And you felt, because of the way he, his mentality and the way he, he thought about the game, he would he would stand a very good chance of being successful. Um, Sean didn't, wasn't quite so sure if Sean would, but um, you know, obviously what he did at Doncaster, where he's been, he's been, he's been quite brilliant. I think he's done an amazing job uh, as a coach where he's been. And um, Bondi, obviously, you know, went along with Harry here and there, and you know the success is there at Portsmouth and various places for all to see. So, now I was pleased that those those boys have, have gone on and done that. And I think when you've played with certain players and they go on and make a career in coaching or management um, at a high level, I, I, it's very satisfying to know that they've, um, you know, that you were hopefully they picked up a little something from you when you were playing or even talking with you that they've maybe brought that into what they're doing. Because as I say, we all learn from the people around us. And, you know, we try and, uh, and, and show that in, in, in the work that we do. I'll let Peter ask you about the match in February 1989 um, against Manchester United. I was there, Luther. That's it. I, I am slightly older. I was, I was there. You're talking, you're talking yeah. at close, it was. <laughs> Unbelievable. 5-1. Five, five and you scored four goals, if memory serves me correctly. So obviously that is a game that will stand out in your memory. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, the the whole game was it. You I always always felt that if I got the service and the ball was given to me when I want in the areas that I wanted the ball, that I would score goals. And in that game, it came together so so well because from just a week of training, almost the players. Because one thing I always did, I would demand the ball where I want it and when I wanted it. And I think players now, strikers now, are probably too polite about when they want the ball and they expect midfield players to do their bit and they get the ball whenever. I wasn't like that. And I don't think, um, I think anyone who scores goals, they want the ball when they want the ball, where they want the ball. And that's the sort of thing that I, uh, in, you know, stress to the players around me. When I want the ball, I want the ball here, that's where I want the ball. And then it's down to me. And um, to a great degree, that's what they did. And in that game, you know, the chances came, and you know, thankfully, they, you know, they most of them went in because it doesn't always go that way. But on that day, it did, and that was made it a very memorable home debut. I have, I have got a memory of another hat trick. I don't, I, I don't know whether you had more than the two against Ipswich. Ipswich, oh. we beat them three one, and you, I know one of them was a penalty, and you, and you were getting an awful lot of stick off the Ipswich fans, if I remember, and you did That's seem right. to take took a lot of delight in celebrating the hat-trick in front of them. Well, it was. I think the one, I, the one I enjoyed the most was the one when I, I think I dribbled from, I think, the edge of the edge of the centre circle and beat about three or so players in and then slotted the ball in from about just about five, six yards out. Um, yeah, that, that gave me a lot of pleasure. And whenever people give me stick, that's, you know, then the only way I can ever really respond to that is to stick the ball in the back of the net. You put the ball in the back of the net and it's stronger and more hurtful to the opposition than any words that you could possibly use. The ball in the back of the net, which means their team is losing. It hurts them far more. So that's something I learned very early on, uh, very early on in my career. 
and that's what I always try to do. Yeah. Uh, of course, one, one, one before, before Craig comes back in, February 89, and that F, the FA Cup match against Manchester United at Dean Court. Yeah. We drew one all at Dean Court. Unfortunately, we lost the replay 1 0. But most of us was, was convinced that late in the game, I think it was Cookie put a ball across, and we could all see you coming in on it, and we were convinced you were held back. So were yeah. you held back? Yeah, what happened was we broke down the right hand side, the ball was laid down, and Cookie got in, and he was in. It was, you know, it was, and I knew all he had to do was put the ball in, and I was going to score. Um, and I got away from, um, I can't think of his name, Bruce, Bruce uh, Steve Bruce, just at the edge of the box to get away from him. And as I was sprinting, I was just about to take off. He realised that he couldn't stop tackle me or anything. Now, and what he tried to do, he just tried to get his foot on my foot as I was trying to take my last stride to reach for the ball. And he actually caught my boot and my boot was actually coming off. And that, by doing that, it just slowed my momentum down enough so all I could get was just a little, the slightest touch on the ball rather than my foot on it. And that's why, and that's the reason why I didn't score on that occasion. And uh, Steve Bruce, you know, he talks about it every now and then when I, when I do see him. It's something that he remembers because that slightest little touch which he managed to get on my boot at that time, that prevented them going out of the FA Cup because obviously, as you said, they beat us in the replay. So yeah. it, it was well worth it. And nobody really spotted what he did so everybody thought that i'd missed a great chance and you know that's we did to we did, it we saw it <laughs> hey? we saw it yeah and that, that, that's what happened yeah <laughs> yeah I, 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 was, I was all i'll just think to myself how could the referee not see it because it had to be a pet it should have been given a penalty for it it's yeah. really something for it because but you know that's that's how it is sometimes you because uh as strikers and whatever you do, you pull fast ones on people as well, just to get to get a toe on something every now and then. And some, some you win, some you lose. What are your memories of that last home match, Luther, of the 89-90 season when we lost at home to Leeds and got relegated? Um, oh. Did the team know what was going on that day? Yeah, well, we did because we we were all told prior to the game, and you know that. Um, best not arrive in your own car at the game. Because the li you tell me something. Why would the why would the the football association why would they make Leeds United come into somewhere down to the seaside um, for a bank holiday weekend to play Leeds United? Why would they have them playing coming at that? Because it's, you know with the reputation Leeds had at that time. It was always going to be carnage, wasn't it? So we all arrived. We got taxis and got dropped off and everything. So nobody drove. And uh, yeah, so we we're completely aware because of what they, uh, you know, they'd caused so much nonsense in the town prior the night before as well. So we knew that the the likelihood there would be all sorts of shenanigans going on at the game as well. Um, I remember, I remember the goal actually that we got. The goal that beat us was a corner. And uh, I remember Paul Miller jumping with it, but he just couldn't get up enough and the ball went over his head and that, I can't remember who was that edited in from behind him. I, and, think uh, I, I think it was Lee Chapman. Mm, yeah, it possibly would have been Lee Chapman, yeah. And that, and, that, and that was that. And it was, I mean, we knew then that because of the, what happened then, you know, that we, were, we were down. It was, it was one of the awful, awful moments. But, um, you know, it, it was just an awful moment. You know, and you think any relegation, and I think that is the that was only the second time I've been in a team. Um, the season before I left Watford, they just got relegated then because we had one of those seasons, and uh, Bournemouth had one then. So yeah, they're the only two times in my career. But the season before that, you were in the team that finished twelfth. Yeah. In the second division, what what is now the Championship. Now, supporters of my generation. We thought we would never do that again. We thought 12th in the championship, that will, historically, that will be the high point, point this club is, is yeah. going to reach. I mean, were you as surprised as everybody else when we eclipsed that over the last few years and got and got premiership status? I'll I tell you what it was, because uh, I, I came to the game where it looked as if it was going to be Bournemouth's last ever game, and it looked like it was all over, and 
you could not have seen or foreseen, I should say, what has gone on since. Seriously, because you thought, I can't believe today could be the last game ever that Bournemouth, AFC Bournemouth play a game um, in the Football League. And thankfully, you know, things went well and they got the result. And Eddie has just done, he, he had performed miracles with building and moulding a team that has done and achieved what it's done. And just as it did at Watford, for me, when you have a small club that predominantly has been, a, you know, a third, fourth division club, suddenly find themselves going to the leagues and actually threatening the big boys and competing with them, it, um, it, it's really a satisfying thing to, to see because it doesn't happen very often. It doesn't happen often. And so for Bournemouth to do and did what they did, with the gait that they get at that place is phenomenal and you know people are disappointed yes you went down but again it wasn't very much the margins of what cost them their premier league status was nothing in reality to what we've seen in, in many years so the margins are that close at this moment in time um injuries had been better towards bournemouth they probably would have stayed up um you know because they hit they hit an early bad patch and then they hit another bad patch, didn't they? And it's very difficult then to come back from that because once they started winning, that momentum wouldn't run. And you'd have thought if they'd won that game at Man City, which, you know, probably, you know, they probably should have got more out of that Man City game. That could, that would have been the difference that they stayed up. You, of course, were at the club in 1990 um, when Harry Redknapp had his car crash that sadly yeah. killed Brian Tyler. Mm. Um, Harry was bad, very badly injured, yeah. as we all know. What are the memories of that time and who stepped in to run the side? It was Jimmy Gabriel that stepped up and became the... Um, he, he, well, he, was, he became first-team coach, you know, stroke manager for that time. Because um, I remember hearing about it I was, obviously we were all watching the world cup and whatever and i remember it came on the news that there'd been a there'd been a car accident and harry redknapp and um you know the car traveling you know harry redknapp was traveling it being an accident and you know there'd been a fatality and this and the other and you know you were just numbed by it because you're thinking goodness me and then when we heard that brian tyler had died it was it, it was very very hard i think for all of us but it was a case of you know we've got we've got a job to do and you know you mourn the passing of somebody a friend a family member or whatever as you do but then it comes a point when you just got to say we have to get on with life we you know and they wouldn't want us still to be thinking about how awful that is now you know we've got to be thinking about tomorrow and what we're going to do to make sure we can get everybody in a better place and uh, that's really how myself and i think many others approach training and the games from that period of time because it was um i remember it was very eerie when i when i came up for the funeral and you just sort of stood around it was all sitting begun on around you and it was almost as if you weren't really a part of it it was just it was it was the most strangest thing at the funeral but uh, you know once it had passed and you sort of get your head back around and you start your training and everything else then you know you uh you do put it behind you, although it never actually leaves you. It's still there. And, you know, whenever night, Italian 90 mentioned, that is one of the first things, even before football, is what comes to mind. When, when, Jerry, you're, when you're at the club, Lisa, um, for the three years, were there any, any of the players in the team that you were particularly close to, so, you know, good friends with? And as a, as a, as a rider to that, who, was, who did you most enjoy playing up front with and the partnerships that were... Um, you know, I think Trevor Aylor, Trevor Aylor up front, myself, it worked really well because I've always played with a big man who was a target man and I played off them a lot. So that's one of the that's one of the things I saw when I in the Man City game. I thought he can hold the ball up, he can hold so that works great for me because I work on you know, once he gets it and he lays it off, I'm looking to break their lines at the back and you know, you push the opposition back to have that space that you can play in. So it, it worked really well for us. So Trevor Aylor was brilliant and I said. You know, we had we had a midfield too. When when these two in midfield playing, you had Bishop, and you had um, oh, lost his name for a second. He and in your academy for a little while as well. Oh my God, it'll kill me. Sean, 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 
Not Sean, not Sean O'Driscoll. No, not Sean O'Driscoll. Mark O'Connor. No, not Mark O'Connor. Another good player, Mark O'Connor. Sean. Oh my God, he's worked. He's, he's, he's worked with your young players and that there. Oh my goodness me, he absolutely killed me. I can't think of his name. I've completely gone blank with his name. No, I'm, I'm going from, from Crystal Palace. No. So you you can't think of it is either like me. It's a, it's Arrow. Arrow. Um, but you know you get, but you, you know when you look at those players that we had in that team, that was you know we, we had some very good players, and I think one of the things that I found with them, there were certain players um, that, I mean, Mozzie just needed somebody to say to him, hey, you you know you. If you just concentrate a bit more on your football, you know, there's more here for you. Mark Newsom, the same, you know, yeah. make your football be the number one thing because you have a very short career, very short career. Um, and one of the things, and Harry said it in, in his book that, you know, I sort of influenced the thinking of some of the players by the way I was so professional about the way I did things. And one of the things was the way you prepared for games and, before that whole game, I remember asking in training, where can I get a decent bit of pasta from somewhere to have my lunch before? Because I, I always have pasta before I play in the evening. So, um, and they, so they told me it was, it was in town. It wasn't Lorenzo's. It was, oh God, what's it called? I can't remember what it's called. But that's where I went and had my, uh, and had my pre-match there, then went home, had a good sleep. Because I was, I was living actually then by the, Right by the pier, the warmer yeah. pier, yeah, at the time. So just went there, had somebody went back, had a sleep, then um, had a bit of tea and toast or whatever, then left for the game, and you know it was it was a good day. So things like that, and it influenced the other players. So they started coming at lunchtime to have a bit of lunch with me at Lorenzo by then. So they would have a bit of pasta before before the game, and and that, and I think it helped them with their preparation. And, and, uh, and the way they looked up, started to look after themselves, and I thought that was uh, uh, that was very satisfying to see players starting to do that because it gives your career longevity. It's only injuries then, <coughs> excuse me, that is going to sort of make shorten that. But because if you do the best you can to keep going as long as you can, then you can enjoy what is one of the best professions that you know I can think of. And of course, for your goals um, at Bournemouth, you won a second golden boot. Yeah, uh, do yeah. tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, you got it there as well. Oh, That's excellent. One. That is the one. That is the golden boot one at Bournemouth, that one. So a lot of people probably haven't seen it, but they've read it, but that's the boot. Awesome nice. stuff. Yeah. yeah, so that was my second one. I won my first one at Watford, and this... This was my second one, and you know I won at Bournemouth for that first season. When really, you know, from you think when I arrived at the end of October, you score what the 19 goals, and probably you know a bit of luck here and there, probably would have nicked a couple more. Now it's very pleasing, very pleasing, and um, I think I scored 19, 19, 18. I think was another the way the goals went, something like that, of the goals that I scored in the time I was there. So yes, I'm I, I'm very pleased, and I love playing football in Bournemouth. The fans, as I say, were were just fantastic. You know, they, they enjoyed, they came to watch their team play and enjoy what their players were producing on the day. And it, you got no aggravation. Of sort, you know, they all came very supportive of what you were doing. And, you know, it was, you know, you're living on the sea, near the seaside as well. So what more can you ask for? Is there any goal in particular, Luther, that does stand out on your journey to winning that fantastic prize? I think the one... Actually, the one, it was my uh, one, two, I think it was the third goal against Hull. Against Hull, that's right. And it was uh, it was Sean Brooks. That was the name I was trying to remember. It's Sean Brooks. Sean Brooks. Uh, it was down at the, which end was it? At? Oh, yeah, it was at the, yeah, it was at the end where the road used to be. Because the ground's turned around now, isn't it? Um, it was at the, it was at that end, and I remember making a run back to goal towards my left, and I pointed to my right there to Sean Brooks, and he knew exactly what I meant as I did that. And as I did that, he played the ball, and I turned and hit it first time. And I, and, um, I think that was a good goal because 
of the way it, it came about. He read exactly what I wanted to do, put the ball in the right place. I turned, hit it early, and it surprised the goalkeeper. And um, yeah, that was a good. That was a good goal for us. But we we scored some very good goals. Some very good goals. They were a good showing. Yeah, yeah, they were. You rejoined Watford for a third time, Luther, um, at the start of 91-92. Yeah. What was the situation like there when you returned? I went there. I went back uh, at the time. It was... Who was manager at the time? Oh, ex-Tottenham. Fullback. Steve, 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 Perriman. Steve, Steve Perriman. That's right. So Steve Perriman was managing. And... I I went back because you know you you're thinking have another two maybe three years of playing at this level, and the opportunity came to go back to Watford to do it. So I grabbed it, um, and you knew that it was going to be more difficult this time because you were going to try and fit into something that was already going or they were working on, and you had to sort of fight your way in, and you're having to fight your way in now when you're what 31. You're now 31, 32, and you're having to fight your way into that team. So it was always going to be difficult. Um, I got in and scored a few goals, but the team ultimately, the game was trying to find its way. And, you know, not many people try to find their way using older players. You need to find your way with the old a bit of experience here and there, but you need to do it with young players because that's building for another two, three, four, five, six years, and you can introduce more young players as you go along. So... It was always going to be difficult for me. And um, at the end of the first year, uh, it was the second year was going and it became more and more obvious that I wasn't going to get too much game time. So I sort of, so I sort of thought to myself, what do I do? I'll, I'll keep playing and um, I'll take one sort of a, not, not a tutorial role, sort of just a, almost a coaching while I'm playing role with the younger players in the reserve team. So I would help out the coach with, the, with helping to bring these young players through. And that last season I was there, um, I played every position bar playing up front. I played left back, right back, centre half, midfield, everywhere but the position that I sort of made my made my career. Because I said to Stuart Murdoch at the time, I said, You've got young boys here. They're looking to make a career. Play them where you want to play them first. So they play in the position that they are trying to make for themselves. And fit me in anywhere. Says I'm, you know, I think I've got enough experience to deal with whatever comes at me wherever I play. And, you know, that's, that's, that's how I approached it and loved it. Absolutely loved it because it was, it was another step on. Um, you know, the opportunity never came again to play in the first team, but... I was uh, I was enjoying doing what I was doing, coaching with some of these young boys and playing. And, you know, I felt that I was still out of use, so <laughs> it was all right. When, when you were at Watford, sticking with Watford for a while, you had, obviously everyone know you had Elton John as the chairman. What was it like having Elton John as your chairman? Well, Elton John as your chairman is, you know, for me at the time, it was just this guy with big glasses and big high heel boots and that were all around because um, my my preferred music was uh, sort of um, soul music, reggae music, that kind of stuff, you know? So Elton John you'd listen to, but it never really took a lot of notes until he became chairman. And then you start to listen to more of his stuff. But um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a great time because he was, he was all about the football. It wasn't about uh, a superstar wanting just to do this as a pastime. No, he was a proper, proper chairman. And, you know, the club was running that way. So it was very enjoyable. And to have somebody like that at the head of it, because whenever Elton John was mentioned, Watford was mentioned. When Watford was mentioned, Elton John was mentioned. So it really worked really well. And it was good publicity for the club, for all of us. And, you know, whatever what club was doing, they would always get a mention, whether it be musical films or whatever, or whether it be football. So it was a very, very special time. And I think with the Graham Taylor as your, as your manager as well, through that period we were very fortunate i think because we had bertie me there as well at one time so, yeah i was very fortunate to have some really special people throughout my career that have worked with worked with me and uh, i've worked for as well so yeah it's, it's been it's my I've, I've had an i've had a great career with injuries or whatever but i've had an amazing career loved every minute of it 
And just going on to England, you played in England's 9-0 home win against Luxembourg, yeah. scoring a hat-trick. Um, what are your memories from that day? I think, you know, making your debut for your country is something you dream as a kid. You know, if you ask kids, yeah, I want to play for England, I want to walk out of Wembley. And that happened to me. I walked out, I was that kid that used to dream of that, and there was I walking out onto the pitch at Wembley. Not as one of the substitutes, but you know, starting in an international, full international for England. And you walk around the bit of the dog track and then you walk onto the pitch for the national anthems and that sort of thing. And, you know, as you walk out the tunnel, the ears on the back of your neck and your arms, it all stands up and, you know, your skin starts bristling and you just feel enormous pride and you just, you just can't wait for the game to start because you just want to just show everybody that you belong and you'll do whatever it takes within the rules to, you know, to win the game, um, you know, because you represent your country. You've got those three lines on your chest. You've got people in the stands that week in, week out, normally are booing you and chatting you all sorts of names. But for this one day, this one game, everybody's together. You're all one voice. And it is, it is quite an amazing thing to do that because when you cross that line, you're one of, one of 11 best players in England at that time. And that is just immense thing to actually comprehend what that's like and you were the fifth black player to play for england and the yeah. first to score you're also the first to score a hat trick yeah. were you conscious of being in the vanguard of black players appearing for the national side no i didn't as i said you know as a kid it was a case of the only color i've ever seen and i think a lot of kids see to see back then is the colour of the shirt that you're wearing and the colour of the opposition shirt. That's all it was. And all I saw was, I'm going to be wearing that white shirt with the three lines or the red shirt, whatever it would be, but the three lines on it, that's what it was going to be. Um, nothing else came, nothing else was important. It wasn't the case in what my colour was or whatever, what number shirt you're going to wear. Don't care. Do not care. You know, just like I did when I was seven or eight, when they said, you're going to play left back, it was shirt in the starting 11. I don't care what it is. I want to be part of that. And for me to walk out and play for your country is the greatest thing that anyone can do. Anything you can do. Because what you do to clubs and whatever, but when you walk out for your country and, you know, people might think I'm diversifying a little bit, you know, when I look at what veterans and I speak to a lot of veterans and have done over this past year, especially, they do that to a far more degree than I do walking out to play a game of football, you know, with the pride that they show when they put their uniform and, you know, and they're going out to fight for Queen and country, whatever, you know, all of us. And sometimes I think we as the people of the country need to remember what these people do and what the sacrifices they make, families and everything to go and do what they do for all of us. And I am forever grateful for all of those, you know, the, all the, all the emergency services, the service people, you know, I think, because I think, would I, could I do what they do? I'm not so sure, but I can walk out on the football pitch and, you know, and a bit of blood, sweat and tears in a day for them. That's nothing compared to what they do. So it, it's a proud moment. One of the greatest moments of my career in life. I think, I think it was Ron Greenwood, I think, was the England manager when you, when you played for him. And I think... Dave, Dave Sexton was in charge of the under 21s, under 23, whatever when he did. And obviously, you played under Graham Taylor and you had a special relationship with Graham Taylor and you played under Harry. Did they have a different style to try and get the best out of you? Because they're obviously very different managers. Yeah, I think Graham and no, I, I don't think they were. I don't think there's very much between them because all they ever wanted you to do was to do your best. And it wasn't a case of putting pressure on you, it was a case of. What are the things that you're good at? You know, that's what it was always for me. What is it that you're good at? And that's what you're going to try and produce when you walk out into the football pitch. You haven't got to go out there and do 10 step overs, knee on the ball, twist. No, that's not what it's about. The things you're good at, if it's making runs, if it's taking people on, if it's crossing the ball, if it's scoring, that is what you're good at. So that is what you work every day in training to get better at. So the other players understand it. And when your teammates understand it, you get better because they give you the ball where you want it, when you want it, at the right pace on it where you want it. And that makes you better, makes the team better, makes everything better. And I think both, both, I think all good managers, coaches, 
that is what they do. And the likes of Graham Taylor, Harry Redknapp, you know, they do exactly the same. England managers, they've all done exactly the same thing. Do tell us a little bit more about uh, the experience that you had uh, Orlando City. Um, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we were going, we were going over for a, for a bit of a holiday, it was. And, um, you know, we had the opportunity to go and and go to Orlando City to meet up with Adrian Heath. And we went and, you know, we met Kaka there. It was just, it was just one of those surreal moments. But I'll tell you one of the most ridiculously surreal moments about the whole thing. There we are, you know, um, Kaka wanted to meet us, which is brilliant. And you think, wow, you know, this world superstar, which has played at Milan just like you did. And, you know, we met and we had a chat about how things were, and that sort of thing. And then we go to the game and we're watching the game and we're walking around the stands, as you know, just walking in. And you would not believe who we walk into. Ian Bishop in Orlando, so many years later, we walk in, we just bump into each other. It's like, how surreal, how weird, how strange, how coincidental, whatever all you want to say. How could that happen in, you know, in a country far flung from here? You know, there you were. Um, you know, so we had a little cat chat and a bit of a catch up and whatever. So, yeah, no, it, it was it was it was quite amazing. It was quite amazing, and you saw a different side of what football, football of a country trying to get their football to a level near where we are, um, and it, it's they're getting there, and they will get there because let's face it, it's America, and they are very much committed to that. The women's game, I think, is further on than what the men's are because they've been doing it longer. So, uh, yeah, they'll get there. But that was what it was about. It was, it was a great experience for myself to go and to go and see them train and speak to some of the players and, you know, speak to Kaka, speak to Adrian and whatever. Yeah, it was it was very special. And then to watch the game. Yeah, a spectacle, which sometimes is not on the pitch but everywhere else. <laughs> and in 2016, um, Bournemouth visited Vicarage, Vicarage Road, of course. Um, and you had a special surprise waiting for you there. Do tell us a little bit more about that day. Unbelievably, yeah, I didn't even knew nothing about it. I yeah, knew nothing about it as well. It was my partner, she had, she had organised it, got my mother to the game, which is unheard of because she was like, I don't want to go down there again. But uh, she, uh, you know, she got persuaded and she came to the game. And then I was called out onto the pitch and I'm thinking, what's going on? I think, yeah, there was some ruse that they were going to present something to somebody, but I didn't know it was me. And, uh, yeah, they presented me with this um, this trophy, and, you know, which was which is quite amazing because there was Graham Taylor, which was one of the last public appearance things that we did together. And um, he presented me with this on the pitch. And then I did a lap of honour around the pitch because obviously it's Bournemouth supporters. So I've left the main, main stand and walked around to the stand where all the Bournemouth supporters are. And it's unusual for you to get as big a welcome with the way supporters <laughs> as you did with your home supporters. And that's what I got. It was just quite unbelievable. And obviously Jeff was there. And Jeff has always been a brilliant supporter for of myself. And you know, we've always got on really, really well. Um, so it it was a very special, very emotional. And you know, I think back on it now that you brought it up, and it was yeah, it was it was one of those days that you will you know, you'll you treasure and always remember. And every now and then pictures come up on, on people's Instagram or Facebook and stuff. And it reminds you of that day when you're walking around. And, you know, I still hear the roar of the Cherish fans and the Watford fans. And, it, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed, really, to have played at two clubs which are so similar in so many ways and suffered the similar fortunes over the past five years as well. You know, I've been in the narrow that. So, yeah, it's... Yeah, I, I'm blessed for it and uh, something I'll always remember. What would you say is... We both, we both got relegated last season, didn't we, both clubs? Um, yeah, we, 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 we it together. We may, we may mention this weekend's game. We may get onto that in a minute. But going into the season, how did you feel? Did you? Did, everyone was talking about, oh, all three clubs are going to go back up again, Norwich, Watford, Bournemouth. I mean, what were your expectations for the three clubs before, before a ball was kicked? My my thing, I believe. Well, I I believe, and I still believe the way things are looking at. Maybe two from three might go go up. Um, 
might be the ones that go up. But I felt that the three teams that came down, because there was so little really between them, I felt that if they kept crucial players or whatever, they would all be in that mix. Yes, you've got Brentford, you've got Swansea, you've got Cardiff now that have sort of broken into that and they're pushing in there as well. But I don't think there'll be anybody else going to come and join that group with Bournemouth. And that. I don't think anybody else will. I think that will be the group that will fight it out to the end. And it's a case of, for me, if Bournemouth are to get themselves properly in that playoffs and then start to knock on the door automatic, I think they've just got to find, and I said it to somebody the other day, I think they've just got to find their game again. They've got to find their sweet spot of the way they play because they've been drawn into a little bit of overplaying at times where they do too much passing and it's looking too pretty. Whereas the game they beat Watford and they beat us 4-1, 4-0, the it came out and that day they were absolutely fantastic. It really was. And Brooks was immense that day. You know, so they moved the ball quickly and, you know, they attacked with such pace and got the ball into the box early in places and, you know, and they kill you. Then You know, they just kill teams off. And they've got to rediscover that. I think they've got into a habit of wanting to play at a too slow a tempo. And I think yesterday's game proved that. Watford started off a bit at a tempo for about the first 20 minutes or so, but then Bournemouth found their feet and started playing and the game sort of panned out. And then it became a game of you attack, we attack, you attack as it went on. And the structure of the game for me was, was not of a team dominant and pressing to win it one, two, three, nil or whatever. It was, you know, Watford and I think gone behind were just trying to get back in the game and Bournemouth were doing everything they could to keep them out. And if they could get one, you know, they get one. And it was that sort of a game really, rather than one of them games we've had against each other in the past where it's been, you know, you, you get battered or you batter the opposition or it ends up being one of those very tight draws or the three, three draw we had at, um, that happened down there a couple of seasons ago. So it, I, just, I just think Bournemouth need to discover that Watford are somewhere near where they need to be with theirs. But you know, can they maintain it? And that is the thing. You feel Norwich with the points gap they have. I've got two, maybe three games in there where they don't have to be at their best and they can still keep their head above the rest. But for the rest of us, we have to now keep picking the points up. You know, away from home, you've got to worst, you've got to come on to the point and then you've got to win your home games. Bournemouth haven't been dominant enough at home. Watford have been more dominant at home, but are now finding points away from home. So Bournemouth need to now start to make, um, you know, need to make, I was going to say Dean Courtland, but it's not that anymore, is it? The Vitality Stadium. They need to make that now more of a fortress that they, you know, they, you know, they win in every game. Even if you end up winning it 1-0 and it's a tough fought one, but you win it 1-0, then teams then start to think, we're not going to get anything when we go there. Because that, at the moment, is gone. Um, <laughs> easy question, Lisa. As an ex-pro, um, how do you feel it would be... You, you mentioned home form and you've got to win your home games and everything. And everyone knows that at the moment, of course, we're all playing in empty stadium, don't we? Um, yeah. Wherever you are. As an ex pro, it just it just occurred to me while you were talking. How much difference do you imagine that makes? You know, um, the fact there isn't any home support does it make it easier? Does it make it easier for the away? How do, how do you think it affects everyone playing in those empty stadiums? I think for the I think no fans makes it a more level playing field because the one thing that gives you an advantage when you're at home is you have more fans there, you have more people supporting, you get that positive energy from them, which assists you to, to, you know, to always find that extra half a yard or whatever. So no doubt about it, it's made it a little bit more even, but, you know, you're still playing on a pitch that's not your normal place that you play when you travel away from home. So the thing for me is the team that are playing at home has got to make it as uncomfortable as they can for the opposition. And I think it's, it, it, it comes from starting the game you know you start with some pace about the game and you get at the opposition and you do not give them a time so they can settle and start to put the plan and everything they've been working on all week in training into practice in the game 
And I think that is the big thing that you you need to stop. Um, you need to stop the opposition doing when they come to your place. And I think at the moment, too many teams are just happy to just go out and pass the ball. You have to get at the opposition. You have to shock them almost the opposition when you first go out. So they think, oh my God, take their breath away. So they think, we're in for a game today. And then I think you've got a chance of, of doing that. Bournemouth used to do that. They used to come out and, you know, they just come at you again. They win the ball back and they come it down the other side. They switch it and come at the other side. You know, they'd be just all the time probing at you. you. At the moment, I think teams are a little bit too cautious with the way they're playing. They're a little bit, a little bit too cautious for me. And you need to just almost say, let's go for it. The result will take care of itself. Let's get that performance. Let's attack. Let's do it. And we should, um, you know, nine out of ten, you'll come away with the result. Towards the end of the game, uh, yes, on Saturday, uh, things got a little bit interesting at the end, Lufa. Um Both teams ended with 10 men. Um, how did you see that incident? Was it passion or was it a little bit out of hand? It was, I, I thought it was a bit of stupidity from all the players. To be quite honest, I was watching the game and, you know, we were saying there's no way this game is going to end with all the players on the pitch. Because there were just thing incidents happening from time to time in the game that players were almost a little bit out of, out of control of what they were doing. I don't know what it was about it, you know, but there were certain things going on. You thought something not quite, you know, players haven't really got their heads in the right place for this game. And so when it started to go, you knew that somebody was going to get sent off. You just, you just knew it. When Chalabar got booked, that for me was one of the main one of the main parts of that game. But there have been incidents all the way leading up to that that pointed out there was more going on on the surface than what what was seen. And as it went on, it just manifested itself and got worse and worse and worse. You know, and um, I remember in the three three, um, you know, Troy saying that the referee bottled it. I don't think this referee bottled it at all. I think this referee, more than anything else, and it was said in the commentary, he could probably have set off a couple more players on each on each side quite easily. And one of the uh, men in that... Uh, that period um, of time. And the players need to be more responsible on both sides. One of the players, of course, involved in all that um, is Dan Gosling, um, who, of course, was coming up against his old side. What what's it like to play your old side and you know how much pressure did that put on him i think when you when you're going to play your own side what you want to do because one thing you know all the players know you've been training with them for the last number of years whatever before you left so they know you inside they know your moves they know what you like they know what you like um so you have to find you have to find something else within you when you play that game to or do something different. So, I mean, what I did when I went, when I played Watford, I never spoke to any of the Watford players. When they arrived at, at Dean Court, it was then, never spoke to them until we got on the pitch. You know, then you just acknowledge people, but, but no, never spoke, spoke to them after the game. But I would never speak to the opposition before the game. They are my mates before the game. I could be my brother on this side. He's no mate of mine because he's wearing a different colour shirt to me today. So... That's my attitude towards that. And apart from crossing that line, which, you know, occasionally we all do it, you know, you do whatever it takes and what you need to do to try and get um, to try and get that victory. So it just come across to me that like there was um, there might have been a little bit of uh, history there with uh, with, with, with Gunston and Lerma in the incident when he's when he's coming after it was um, Pedro. Try to clear the ball at the same time because did he make a bit of a meal of it? All players who've seen it, it's got worse and worse season on season. They all make a meal of it. Um, I think it come. I think it's coming to the point where the the officials in the game need to now, when players do that, and you can always tell if a player is injured, you know a player is injured, and if they're messing around on the floor, you know, they, you know and if it proves that, and if you and if they can get up and run it, you should look them. Look and we'll send them off because that's ungentlemanly conduct, that's cheating, and that's that shouldn't be allowed. And they just stamp it out the game. It's getting so bad that kids are doing it more and more, and they think it's now part of the game and it's wrong, it shouldn't be going on. Um, for me, 
when I was playing, goodness me, the last thing you want to do is roll around on the floor. Because if you roll around on the floor, then they think, all right, all right I've hurt him now. I'm going to get him to have another one in a minute. You know, you know, they. It, I just think, I just think, players need to be more responsible. All players. Yesterday we all saw what happened, and we'd all have different thoughts on it. But in total, players, every player that walks onto that pitch when they're going to play, need to be mindful that they've got people and mostly kids that will copy what they do. So if they roll around, the kids will roll around on the floor and they're not hurt. They've got to bring that honesty back to football because we used to say that it was all the foreign players. You know, I remember back in sort of 70s and 80s, when you were, especially when you were watching the World Cup back in sort of the early 70s or whatever, it would be a case of, oh, look at the, you know, look at them rolling around as if they've been shot, blah, 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 whatever. You know, and that's crept into the game here more and more and more and more. And it's got to the point where now, you know, it's it's, it's accepted and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be accepted. I, I I can't accept players doing that, whether it's a player of my team. I mean, I'd be embarrassed if a player of my team did that. Of course, there is a lot of teams um, challenging for that those top six places. Uh, Norwich are quite a way ahead. Watford are eight points above where we are at the moment. Um, but you mm. throw into the mix Brentford, Swansea, Reading, um, Barnsley, Cardiff. Oh, who do you think might miss out? And who do you think, you know, what do we need to do to stay in there? I think, I think I... I'd be very surprised if Barnsley make it into it. I, 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 I'd be more surprised if Barnsley make it into that group. And I think the other one that might miss out of this at the moment could be Reading. I think Reading might miss out because Reading seems to be, they seem to have hit a really difficult patch and it's gone on for a period of time for them because they were, they were like, they were, weren't they six points or so clear at one time? Yeah, yeah. You know, they've hit, they've hit a bit of a patch for the last probably two or so months where they have find it very difficult to, string some results together um so i think reading could be the one that drops out of all of that uh, I, I i believe bournemouth now will hopefully start to pick one or two results and whether they'll get enough to get automatic will depend on how all the teams up there fear over the next couple of months because that is key for them doing so because they've got to lose two or so games those two games to close that gap so there's there's a lot of work to be done but we all know that in this division in particular you know you hit periods where it's not going right for you and it's which it's whichever club whichever group of players can haul themselves out of that dip quickest and it only lasts for maybe one two games like it did with norwich norwich only had a couple of games where they were a bit iffy but now they seem to be back on it that is what's going to make the difference. You cannot now afford at this stage of the season to lose three games out of four or two games out of two games out of four. You can't afford to do that now because it's going to be very difficult to make that gap up because you lose that now. Teams are asking six, eight, nine, ten or more points ahead of you. and They won't throw that away before the end. I'm going to put you on the spot, Lufa. Um how do you think it's going to end? Who, which two teams do you think will go up automatically, and who do you think might make it through the playoffs? I, I think, I think Norwich, if they hold their nerve now and continue like they're doing, Norwich should be there. The other one that should make it, I feel, is going to be Swansea or Brentford. But Brentford now have hit a couple of results, and they were it's not quite going for them. It's how quickly they can recover from that. And then you've got the likes of Cardiff getting ahead of steam again, going again now. So, I mean, I, I, I think the automatic will go to one of those three, two of those three. It will go to Norwich, Brentford, Swansea. They're going to be the ones. Because at the moment, they are the ones that are, will be clear of everybody if they win, especially Swansea win their games in hand. Then they Swansea win their games in hand, they'll be clear of everybody. So they'll be... For me, there that's going to be that's going to be the difference because you've still got to make those points up on them, and I think we've all got to play them again. So you'd have your chance to pull three points back on them. But is it you know what is going to happen to you in that mirror at a time before you get to the play them? So then for me, that's going to be and the rest will be in the playoffs. And I know a lot of fans, especially after yesterday, are thinking Watford, Watford, Bournemouth in the, in the playoff together. 
Okay. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Especially if fans can get back in their Lufa as well. You know, yeah. it'd be a it'd be a very interesting playoff it, final, wouldn't it? It will, it will. Um I just think it's an I just think it's unfortunate that there is now this hatred, it seems, between the fans of the two clubs. I find it very sad that that's happened because the clubs are so similar in so many ways, um, you know, and for this. And, you know, they almost have a bigger rivalry at Bournemouth than they do at um, that lot down the road, Luton Town. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, to close on, um, just going back to your career, what would you say, Lufa, is your biggest memory in the whole of your career? football career biggest memory is going to be walking out for at Wembley to play for England that is it because that is the pinnacle of what you as a professional footballer want to do you may win the FA Cup you may win the League Cup you may win the league or whatever whatever division you're in but to walk out to represent your country is the pinnacle and for me that is the standout moment um, and then after that you know, there are things, Manchester United in 78, when we beat them 2-1 and I scored both goals up there, first time at Old Trafford. Being a form, well, being a Man United supporter as a kid, going there at Old Trafford for the first time of your heroes. Amazing to go there and do that. Um, Bournemouth, making my debut there was incredible. But one of the games I remember, 3-3, Man City. Ridiculous. I had a penalty right at the end of the, near the end of the game. Having been 3-0 down, we got it back to... 3-3 three, three. and I remember when I went and got the ball from behind the goal where our fans were and I told them where I was going to actually put the ball and thankfully I did put it in that top uh, in the goalkeeper's top left hand corner so yeah and that got us 3-3 three, three. that was a that was an amazing so there's been some amazing highlights playing for playing in Italy playing yeah, there's been some incredible periods of my career but but they're sort of the standout ones making my debut at home debut for Bournemouth was, was brilliant making um scoring up at Old Trafford for Watford is sensational and obviously England getting a hat trick as well was was really what it's all about. What what dreams are made of. Boys dreams. And girls now, let's not forget that. <laughs> <laughs> well it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on here and I speak for the whole of the Cherries Trust. Yeah, but you. you know, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it's guys, it's my absolute pleasure. Bournemouth, as I says, I look my time at Bournemouth as an extension of what I did and achieved at Watford because for me there was very little between the two clubs on that front and that's why I think I settled in so quickly and you know the feeling I have for the Bournemouth fans and the Watford fans it is pretty much the same because for me they're family and it's you know whenever I go there it's like coming home. Yeah, well, thank you so much again Lufa mm -hmm. and it's been an absolute pleasure for you to join us today. Thank you very much guys. Fingers no problem crossed. at all. Fingers crossed that we both go up. Thank yeah, you, yeah, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Lufa. Thank you, guys. Take care now. Thank you. Take Enjoy care. Bye-bye. And you. And thank you, Peter, as well, for joining me today. It's been an yeah. absolute pleasure, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been brilliant. It's been brilliant. Thanks so much, Greg. No problem at all. And thank you, everybody, for watching this video today. Um, please do remember to hit the like and the subscribe button as well. Do also remember there will be a link in the description of how to join the Cherries Trust, either as an unpaid member or as a member. It only costs £10. So please do do join us. Um, I will be presenting regular shows on a regular basis. But until the next video, up the cherries. And thank you for joining me. Bournemouth, for the first time ever, are heading to the top flight of English football. This is what being a football fan is all about. Together, anything is possible.